And welcome to the Financial Wellness Hour. I am your host, Hirsch Sermon, and I am absolutely thrilled to have you here today with us on WGSNDB, Going Solo Network. This show is for people wanting to learn more about creating financial wellness. And we're going to look at different life cycles and different events. We're going to explore them both financially and emotionally, because personal finances are usually not about the money, but they're really more about your emotions associated with your finances. And the healthier you are emotionally, the better prepared you are to make better financial decisions. We're going to be somewhat general in our discussion, but we would love to hear from you so you can reach out through my website, lifecycle.financial. That's lifecycle.financial. Or you can post your questions on YouTube, Facebook, or any of the other dozens of platforms you might be listening to us on. Yesterday, I just want to point out, was the opening season for tax in the U.S. This means that the IRS officially started accepting electronic filings for W uh, for your 2022 taxes. And the sooner you get those in, the sooner you can get a refund. If you have any questions, please do reach out to me. As I said, my website is lifecycle.financial. You know, the other thing when it comes to creating financial wellness is that it can actually be quite daunting to start making decisions about something that you're not that familiar with. Add to that the stress of a major life cycle like a divorce or something like that, and people become even more stuck than they might have been before. Working with a professional truly can make a world of difference when it comes to moving forward and making those decisions. My advice here is to work with a professional that's experienced and well-versed in the area that you need help with. Don't use your attorney as your financial expert and don't use your financial expert as your attorney. But once you do pick your professional, make sure you're aligned, that you're both on the same page and working with the same approach. Remember, often the professional you're working with is coming from it from an objective perspective and you are more emotional or subjective when you're approaching it. A big question then is, how do we overcome obstacles in making financial divorce or financial decisions in general? What do you do? One of the things you want to do is call Kelly Nilsson. Kelly is the founder of Brava Financial LLC. She is, and I'm going to quote from her, working as a financial planner and coach, I support people who want a positive and prosperous relationship with money by integrating finance with their highest values and aspirations. I love this for a few reasons. One of the big reasons is I firmly believe you should be living a values-based life. It's much more fulfilling. Another reason is far too many people have a negative or an adverse relationship with finances. As I said earlier, it's not always about the money, but very often the emotions associated with your finances. Kelly has had her CFP, I believe, for about 20 years this year, if I remember correctly. Uh, you also have a JD, your law degree. You've seen the markets go up and down. Hopefully, we see more up than down. Uh, but obviously, has a tremendous experience over this time as well. Kelly, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Hirsch. I am absolutely delighted to be here with you today. I also want to thank you for the early morning. It's much easier when uh, I say 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. in, in my uh, marketing, but that's because I'm towards the east side of the country. Coming from California, it's, it's a very early morning, and I do appreciate that. Absolutely. I am going to ask, though, before we kind of get into a lot of the, the discussion, just to share a little bit about your background so listeners can really understand somewhat your experience, some of your passion, why you do what you do. Yes, thank you. So I celebrated my 30th anniversary in the financial services business um, last year, as a matter of fact. Um, I started off in this industry um, actually on the business to business side of the industry. So my clients for the first 17 years of my career were advisors and brokers. Um, and I pivoted to working directly with clients and investors shortly after my son was born in 2007. And um, I reflect on that and really appreciate that path for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, um, 
that first period of time when I was working with advisors and brokers gave me insight into the dynamic and really rich relationship between an advisor and a client. Um, and I saw the full spectrum. I saw really transformational relationships and I saw some relationships that gave me pause. And so um, the way I approach working with clients is informed by that, of being able to be that observer. Um, the other thing that's really important to me is that I've always been fascinated by this industry. It's very dynamic. As you point out, there's a lot of psychology in this, more so than perhaps the market up and ups and downs. Um, but I really found my connection and my passion to the business when I started working with clients directly. Um, I believe I'm... I'm really a, a problem solver. I love to do puzzles of all different kinds. I love to put pieces together. And so professionally, that's the way it expresses. Um, I look to help clients resolve issues and problems that they have. And um, that has to do with money, but money integrates in a lot of different other ways. And so that's a little bit about me. And I finally got to the point, Hirsch, after 30 years that I figured, well, maybe I should just do this myself. So I launched my firm in 2022. Um, you know, after 30 years, I finally figured, yep, yeah, now's the time. It, so that's and I want to just point out for those listening, you know, somebody will say to you sometimes, I've been in the industry 10 years, and that sounds like a long time. But if you think about the last 10 years in the financial planning world and the market, you really have not seen until very, very recently a downturn or a major downturn, right? I'm not talking about even when COVID hit because it spiked right back up within, I don't know, 10 months or something. Being able to work with somebody who's got not just the longevity and experience, but has been through these markets and understands how do people react, how, do the industry, how does the industry as a whole react is very, very important. And there's not that many people because you've got to have been in the industry for 15 years or more to have really experienced that within the markets, which is so different, uh, you know, to, oh, I've been in the industry 10 years, sounds like a long time, but uh, you haven't been through really a full cycle, if you could call it that, of the market going up, going down, hitting that 20% down and, and coming back up over time. So I do think that is is something you bring to the table in addition to everything else that is so important as well. well and then I'm going to ask before, as I said, before we kind of jump into that whole, what are the obstacles holding us back? I thought it would be important for people to, to really understand whether you in the middle of creating a plan, you have a plan or know that you need one because everyone needs a plan. I'm, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the general financial planning as a whole right, and creating financial wellness and, and creating wealth. So I'm going to ask, can you share a little bit, what should somebody be thinking about as they approach that plan? Or maybe even, you know, when they create a financial plan, what are some of the steps that they will or should be going through in doing that? So when I think about planning, and I, and I, I want to be clear that I think that there should be a distinction between a plan and planning. So a plan, when I present a plan to a client, is sort of a, a snapshot or it's a it's a summary. It has some information that gives us direction in terms of where we're going, but it is um, essentially almost out of date the within a couple of weeks after we create it, because we live in this world that is constantly changing. Planning is a process. Planning is an activity. It's an ongoing. Um, it's a. It's an ongoing uh, process, evergreen, if you will. And so I think about that in terms of how I operate with clients. And by the way, planning is something that uh, people can do on their own, given that they have a good start and a good framework. So um, I think that you can work with a professional in a number of different ways. You can decide to work with a professional on a project basis. You can have an ongoing relationship, but the plan is the snapshot. The planning is really where a lot of the work gets done because that's where you're integrating everything that is changing and growing and um, just 
the the way in which you have to pivot when things change, which is really important. And I, I like that because firstly, it aligns with a lot of the way I work. Actually, I like to have that outline, that plan that we're going to accomplish and then kind of give homework periodically as I work with people. I think they learn a lot more by instead of throwing it over the fence and saying, oh, you know, that person's going to take care of it. As they learn what it is, when they need to make, you know, decisions down the road, that becomes a very important piece of their learning to be able to do that. Our lives are very dynamic, whether it's, you know, I, I mentioned earlier divorce, but if we have a child, if we get married, uh, if our children get married, these are all major life cycles that need to be thought about and an adjustment made to whatever plan is in place. So as you said, it could be a few weeks later sometimes and things are changing. And, and that's actually, I, I think, uh, a, a big setup in a way for my next question, because it's sometimes hard for a client to think out into the future. You know, I, I know, you know, it's January right now, it's cold. I want to go somewhere warm in the summer. I mean, I can think six months out, right? But really when you're creating a plan, you have to balance that long-term 20 year look or maybe even further out into the future with, you know, what's going to happen in 10 years and what's going to happen in 10 weeks. How do you, help clients or how do clients uh, need to balance all of those priorities when it comes to creating that financial plan? Yes. So one of the phrases that keeps coming up for me, and I just love it, is this idea of being directionally correct. So what that means is, and, and by the way, as a planner, I have always had a, a real discomfort with trying to run projections that are maybe out past a five-year time horizon. I think if you're doing a retirement projection and telling somebody that they're going to be able to retire with this much, you know, this, this big a pile of money in 25 years, I mean, there's no, there's no value in that other than perhaps giving someone a sense of security. But we just don't know how that 25 right. years is going to unfold. And so it just, I tend to um, de-emphasize that. And really what I want to look at is, okay, in the next three to five years, are we taking steps so that they are directionally correct and aligned with what you've expressed are the goals that you want to achieve? So instead of talking about retirement, I, I really frame it as financial independence. And that looks like a lot of different things to, to different people. Right. But that's really what we're looking at, which is you can have those long-term goals and you should, right? We should all be moving toward something that we want in our lives. But when it comes to actually determining what we're going to fund and the techniques that we're going to implement, to me, we're really looking out at a shorter time horizon because we have more influence over what's going to happen in the next, say, three years than we do the next 30. Right. I think that is such valid advice for people to keep in mind. Directionally, I love that, that, that phrase, directionally correct, because there are certain things or tenants, if you can call it that, that are going to apply. For example, you know, I've had somebody come to me who's 50 and says, oh, I want to retire in, in, you know, 15 years. And I'll say to them, okay, well, you know, tell me a little bit about what you've saved so far and what, you know, all these kind of questions that, oh, no, 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 I'm starting now. And I'm thinking, what you're telling me is you want to, in 15 years, save enough to live off without an income for the next 15 years. Unless you're putting a whole bunch of what you're earning away, that's just not going to happen realistically. So I think there are some things like that that obviously will always play in. But as you said, it's unpredictable. You know, five years ago, the world was a completely different world, taking your time frame of five years. With COVID coming into play and, you know, everything that we've seen, uh, I'm not sure that we can really go beyond three to five years. I've, I've always agreed with that. I think, though, the planning and the disciplines that we build help us get there. And we obviously tweak as we go, but I, I just think that is such valid advice and people need to understand 
that it's nice to have a thought of where we could be 20 years from now, but really to understand that there's no way to really predict that. You know, I think that's very, very important. Right. Um, and, and one of the, if I can just interject here um, along those lines, Hirsch, that one of the values of working with a planner is you have a sounding board and you have that person in your corner who is going to highlight the progress that you're making. And I think that's something that, again, for us as individuals, we are much more apt to focus on the things that are going wrong, um, the, the negative aspects of our life. And you've got somebody that you're partnering with saying, hey, you, you need to take a look and, and reflect and look back over the last 12 months and look at all of the things that you've accomplished. You fully funded your, your right. cash cushion goal. You have made strides in you know, whatever aspect of planning it is. Um, and again, that gets to our topic of really trying to overcome obstacles. Um, sometimes all we can see is that big rock in our way. Right. And having that partner who's saying, do you see how much you've chipped away already? Um, I think that ga that can really put some gas. I, in I actually head. have a beautiful example that, that is exactly this. I was working with a couple who they were trying to eliminate debt and they were carrying quite significant debt, some medical, some uh, quite a lot, about 38,000 in credit cards. They had a home and they had one of their two cars that they still owed money on. And they were just kind of haphazardly placing money towards all these debts. And I, restructured how they were doing it. And within 14 or 15 months, they paid off about 35% of those credit cards. And they said, we still have so much. And I looked at that going, all right, in 15 months, you've knocked out an enormous amount. Let's look at the prior 15 months. How much had you knocked out of it, right? And they, they kind of got a gauge of that and saw that when they had that structure and that advice and guidance, that they really could make much larger strides. And we, we figured out they could actually eliminate their debt almost two and a half years earlier by knocking off those huge interest credit cards first before they went to like the medical debt that is at zero percent. So absolutely being able to have somebody advise you and celebrate those wins. And it could even be I'm starting to put $50 away a paycheck into my, you know, my 401k. You've never done that before. That That's a step that sometimes is a big step for people. So I agree with that 100 percent. And yes, going into the, the topic with that, I think, you know, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit more about what you kind of call the big disconnect, right? You have clients and we give them wonderful, personalized, you know, spot on uh, advice and they don't take it or they don't go into action or they're not sure what to do with it or how do I implement that? So I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about that, if you would. Sure. So, um, I am really fascinated by how frequently I hear from other planners, hey, you know, I, I did this great plan and my client just won't take the advice. And what I find we slip into is we slip into this very easy process of saying, oh, well, they're flaky or they don't get it or the reverse. A client says, I don't, my, you know, my planner just is too brusque or, you know, is too whatever. Those are those are characteristics. Those are personality issues, right? And so I I always find that that's kind of a an easy out. What I think is happening is that we may be operating with different frameworks, right? When we as financial planners live in what I call the problem solving mode, which is right. a zone that's very much sort of the scientific method. It's objective. It's breaking down a problem that very often is a math problem. And then we come to the client and we say, well, here is, here's what you need to do. But the client may not be in problem solving mode. The, the client may be somewhere else. They may be dealing with um, issues around money that, as you pointed out earlier, are entirely emotional. Um, or there may be some issues that they have if they're um, you know, married or if they're in a partnership those may be manifesting. And that's a disconnect of framework. That's not, you know, somebody being kind of, you know, ditzy or what have you. To me, it's like trying to have a conversation in a big house where I'm in the living room and the other person's in the back bedroom. 
I mean, we can try shouting at each other and we right. might be able to communicate, but really what we need to do is get together. We need to be in the same room on the same page. And so I've been really spending a lot of time thinking about how fundamental it is, even before you try to address whatever the financial problem is, is to make sure that you and the client are operating in sync in the same mode. And that takes a lot of work um, and you works. have to kind of get rid of a lot of assumptions. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm going to make a couple comments uh, on this before you go in too much further. And we are going to have to take a break. So don't lose your train of thought, write it down. Um, but one of the things is also to take it from the perspective of the client when you can. You know, one of the things I've seen with that is they'll come with a, you know, 20, 25 page game plan for them. And it's beautiful with charts and colors and, you know, all the rest. And they say, well, let's really go start on page six. Well, then did you need page one through five, right? Simplify it to your client. They may only really need three or four pages of that 20 page plan. You can always put it at the back and say, if you want to go through all the mechanics of it, et cetera, but here's the essentials. Focus on their view versus your view, right? We want to impress them clearly. There's no question, but I think, both sides need to learn how to work with each other. You know, the client with a professional, the professional with a client. And I tell prospects all the time, I am very good at what I do, but I may not be the right professional for you particularly. Just because your friend used someone and had great results doesn't mean you are. Vet the professional you're going to. There's actually a blog specifically about attorneys, but it applies to any um, professional that's on my website if anyone wants to go look it up. Uh, but make sure that it is the right person for you. You understand everything with that. And before we go to break, Kelly, I'm going to ask, can you share how people can get in touch with you to learn more? And then we're going to go to break and come back. Yes. Um, the best way to learn all about me is to go to my website, which, it, which is bravafinancialplans.com. And that's plans with an S, bravafinancialplans.com. Um, I do a lot of writing. So if you really want to unpack uh, my life story, then um, there are a number of blog posts that will give you great insight into how my wheels turn. All right, when we come back, we're going to recap what we've covered and we're going to get back into this misalignment a little bit. We will be right back. Don't go anywhere. Thank you. Hello and welcome back to the Financial Wellness Hour. I am your host, Hirsch Sermon. We are on WGSNDB, the Going Solo Network, and our guest today is Kelly Nilsson, the founder of Bravo Financial, LLC. And we've been discussing, actually, it's it's been a lot of different things. I'm going to try to get it all in as a recap. Uh, but we really started a little bit about your background, a little bit um, about some of the steps to think about 
uh, knowing that this is a dynamic life, so our plan needs to be dynamic with that. How do we balance our long-term and short-term needs and keep both in focus, I think was a part of that. Um, how to vet or spoke a little bit about vetting professionals and, and making sure that they're the right ones for you. We were speaking about modes in which we operate, uh, planning versus a plan. And uh, I love the term that you use, directionally correct. But one of the things that uh, we didn't quite finish our discussion was when you have a professional that you're working with and you have a client who are not aligned, they have this uh, alignment that, that, that is not quite there. And both the plan and the client clearly want the same results. However, the two of them are, as you put it, operating in different modes. So how do you bring them into alignment? How do you uh, help them realize which mode to be in, I guess, in you know which situation? I'm going to ask if you can elaborate a little bit on that and maybe uh, you know continue our discussion that we were having around that. Um, well, the first thing to do, I think, is to be aware that there is a disconnect or there is some kind of, um, you know, friction, I suppose. And, and I would say that um, friction, I look at friction and tension as different things. I think in any professional re relationship, there's always going to be a little bit of tension. Again, that's sort of you know, you have to have tension if you're building a bridge, right? That's what kind of holds the, the bridge together. And so um, tension is not necessarily a bad thing. I think friction, if you can't necessarily get things moving in the right direction, that's clue number one. Okay, something is happening here. And, and so I think it's incumbent upon the professional to sort of diagnose that. What is happening? I'm giving good advice. I feel like I'm being empathetic what's the problem in terms of getting to the implementation phase? And that's the opportunity, I think, for the planner to say, okay, and incorporate the conversation with the client too, which is, hey, let's talk about this and get the client to really open up and express what it is that they feel is holding them back. And again, a lot of times it's it's fear of something, right? And, and so, it may be an opportunity to just really kind of listen, listen a lot and let the, the client express what's happening. And then again, the planner can determine, okay, is this something that we can solve together? Or is this something that I'm just not equipped to, to take on? And that this is where I think, again, having some therapeutic model sometimes is really important. Now, I, as a financial planner, I don't do financial therapy. Um, I So I'm going to ask a, a favor before we get into yeah. that, because that is a whole discussion of its own in many ways. I just want to point out, I think there's a few things there that, that need to be reiterated. One is that communication is key and that can be both ways. Sometimes a client thinks, well, I told you what my goals are. I told you what my resources are, go figure it out. Well, that's not really how the relationship works. So I do wanna put some of that onus on the client as well. I think that being able to communicate well and I think both ways, if you don't feel that you're able to implement something, don't just nod your head. Right. and walk away and say, oh, you know, if you're nodding your head and agreeing, your professional thinking, it's going to come into play and it's going to be done. At the same time, this is a professional who works for you and they do have the obligation, as you kind of pointed out, that we need to take care of our clients and make sure that, that our discussions and our agreements are ultimately acted on. So I do think right. that both of those sides need that. And that's where, why it's called a relationship as opposed to something else. Right. And I, I agree with you. I think, you know, someone can have trauma in their life as we've discussed, you know, I would even put the category of financial trauma out there, you know, and I don't know that there's an official category like that, but it can come from when you were a little kid, the home you grew up in. It can come from a marriage that you've been in and somebody was, you know, controlling of, of finances, whatever it might be. But these are all traumas around finances. So I'm going to ask to bring it back. What are your thoughts around financial trauma and 
working through it, which you started on that I kind of delayed you on. So bringing you back to it. This is really the, the deep end of the pool where a lot of us swim. And it's really important for us to be equipped to swim in this pool. And financial trauma is a thing. It is yeah. absolutely um, critical that people reflect on their experiences with money, what lessons they've taken away, and again, what their operating framework is with money. And that is to me what keeps people out of problem solving mode. That's what keeps them in a different room of the house is often um, either not understanding their frameworks or having unresolved issues. And both of those, if they're present, need to be addressed. And so um, the other challenge I think that we uh, planners often have is that we really want to solve all of the issues, right? We really want to um, be that helper, be that fixer, because that's just, you don't get into financial planning unless you have that um, as part of your operating framework. But to your point earlier, Hirsch, it is so important for professionals to realize there are some things that I can't help with, or I'm not the right person. And that just is counterintuitive with a lot of planners who feel like they're, you know, they are the ones that that are uh, the fixers. Um, and so I try to be very thoughtful and very mindful of who am I best equipped to serve. And if I see something that is um, is a need that a client has, I want to refer that person out to whoever can help them in the same way that I would for like an estate plan. I'm right. not a licensed attorney. I don't do uh, estate plans, but I can see when it when there's a need and I refer out appropriately. And I do think that um, the emotions around finances sometimes don't command the same respect, again, because we're not writing a legal document, right. but it's just as important to be um, empathetic and to be understanding and also have those contours of, hey, I can help you with this, but on that particular issue, we need to bring in some um, some additional helpers. I think all great points and finding and making sure that they focus on your area. You have people call themselves a boutique firm, they'll call themselves whatever. What does that mean for me? Like, does that mean you can actually help me or not help me, right? I had a, a, a client uh, who was referred to me said, oh, they need help with taxes. And I had to specify, you know, I do not do corporate returns. I do not do trusts. There's certain areas of the tax code I have not had that exposure to. I'm not going to be your guy. You want a personal tax return done? I can knock it out by the end of the day kind of thing. But there's certain things that you need to understand as a client and, that where, and that's where my comment comes from. I'm not always the right person for you that you need to be communicating and that communication up front and all the way through becomes so important because your needs do change and it might be three years later that they change, but being able to work through that and make sure you're being taken care of and have the right people on your team becomes very, very important as well. Having more people on your team sounds kind of, intuitive sometimes, but sometimes adding that one person to your team is going to help you significantly. It sounds like it's going to muddle the waters or, the, you know, it, it's going to uh, cost you more or whatever it might be, but sometimes it's actually the right move. So make sure you have the right people on your team, I think are very, very important. Absolutely. So what are, what are some good questions people, <laughs> and I'm going to, you know, this show generally focuses more on divorce in general. What are some of the good questions? But when somebody is going through a divorce or somebody is uh, in the middle of that divorce deciding, or maybe even beyond divorce, what are some questions that maybe they should be asking or thinking about when they're looking at putting their financial plan together? So let's start again with the, the big issue, which is that uh, divorce is traumatic. Um, even in the most sort of amicable split, you are 
essentially dismantling two people's lives. And so whether that comes with real deep lasting uh, trauma or whether it's just sort of a period of time where there's a lot of discomfort or what have you, uh, you know, it's going to leave a mark, right? There's, there's just no way about it. And so again, starting from that premise of, okay, I've got this really heavy thing happening um, and giving yourself time and space and whatever you need to process that. And number one, find an advisor that is, is open to making space, right? And not all, not all planners are, not all planners are super comfortable getting into those sort of emotional issues, but it's really important. And then the second thing is, um, I think really understanding where you are on the spectrum of, I've never dealt with my finances before, and this is a brand new world for me, all the way to, I am almost a CFO and I just need some backup because that's going to inform the type of person that you're looking for. Um, and, and so I think really understanding what it is that you need, almost creating that avatar, right? If I had a perfect financial partner, here's what they would look like. Here's how they would present. Um, and then you can get into all of the sort of, you know, background issues, right? How long have you been in the business? Are you a fiduciary? How do you charge? But really, this is, again, a very close relationship. Um, You know, I think people are just not comfortable talking about money. And so it's going to get really, um, you know, it's not always going to feel great. But very vulnerable. Definitely. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Um, So that's where I start. I really want the the person who's seeking that advisor to have thought about what they need and what they're looking for. So I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this. It used to be all those people out in, in radio world out there. Uh, now it's podcast world and Roku world and everything else. But I'm asking this question because I think um, for somebody who knows they need to move on getting something going, I think sometimes the first step may be the most difficult. They they don't even know who, who to call. I'm intimidated, right? So a prospect calls and says, hey, you know, I, I heard you on the radio, Kelly. I'd love to learn more. How do you get them started, set those expectations with them? What are some of the things that you do? So the first thing that I do in the course of my initial conversation is really understand what that person is looking for. And usually it comes down to some aspect of their finances that they are um, not clear on, right? And so um, I've worked with um, quite a few people who have gone through a divorce. And the one thing that I hear is, am I going to be all right? That's really that's really the summary. Am I going to be all right? And so uh, part of what I do is listen, give them an opportunity to describe all of the um, areas of their finances that they understand. Where do they have questions? And then again, because I because of the, the model of my business, um, I don't sell investments. I don't sell any products. Clients pay me for advice then what I do is, is number one, determine if, are they a good fit? You know, do I really feel like I can help them? Um, And then I put together a proposal and uh, there's a dialogue about here's, here's all of the thing, here are all of the areas where I think I can help. Does that sound like is something that you want to do? So there's a lot of exploration. I would say that's really what it is. So it's being educated, but educating at the same time is is a big piece of this, which is important because people should be making informed decisions. I I think that's very important. And I'm always amazed at how quickly the time goes because I have probably another half a dozen questions. (laughs) But before we wrap up, where should people go if you can repeat that if they want to get in touch with you and learn more? Best place to go is my website, which is bravafinancialplans.com. And that's plans with an S, bravafinancialplans.com. Great. 
I encourage everyone to go there. I want to thank you, Kelly, for waking up early, still sharing in a very structured manner and, and a very logical progression of how people can start the journey, or even if they're on the journey, it really continue that journey because it is a journey. It, it's not going to be something you set up and you put on the bookshelf because, oh, you know, I put it all together. So I do think that's important. As Kelly had mentioned, she writes quite a bit. So I, I would encourage you go get comfortable, learn a little bit more about her and learn for yourself some of the things that, that you may not have known before. I am Hirsch Sermon, your host for the Financial Wellness Hour. I appreciate you joining us. Please reach out to me. My life, my, excuse me, my website is lifecycle.financial. That's lifecycle.financial. You can reach out for me or for Kelly, either one. Please uh, get your taxes going. I always encourage people. It seems like that deadline in April comes up before people know it. CC Schatz, our producer, thank you so much for all that you do behind the scenes. And I look forward to you joining me next time on my show. Have a great week and thank you so much.